Over the last weeks, we've been discussing the fourth foundation of mindfulness, and in particular, the factors of awakening, and how each one, beginning with mindfulness, leads on to the next. So we talked about continuous mindfulness leading to wisdom through the development of investigation and inquiry which is the second enlightenment factor. And then as the Buddha goes on to describe, in one who investigates, inquires with wisdom, in one who investigates and examines with wisdom and embarks upon a full inquiry, tireless energy is aroused. And in one who has aroused tireless energy, piti or rapture is aroused. And by developing it, it comes to fulfillment. So we've talked about the first three factors of awakening. Tonight I'd like to begin the discussion about the fourth factor, which is rapture. Rapture is one translation of the Pali word piti. It's P-I-T-I. And this word has been translated into English in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's translated as rapture, sometimes as joy, as happiness, as delight, as pleasurable interest, as rapt interest. And tonight I'll be using each of these words uh, somewhat synonymously. Just reflect for a moment on the felt sense of what these words mean. So just as you hear them, sort of embody them for a moment. You know, rapture, happiness, joy, delight, pleasurable interest, rapt interest. They're pretty delightful states. You know, and so I think it's, it's good to appreciate that this quality of delight is actually a factor of awakening. PT has the function of refreshing and delighting the mind and body. That's the function of PT, it's how it works. It's like feeling a cool breeze, you know, on a really hot summer day. When PT is present, it makes whatever it experience arises with it. You know, whether it's an experience of the body or the mind, when PT is present, it makes that experience endearing because of this quality of delight. And it's precisely this aspect of endearing the mind or causing the mind to feel endearment toward what's arising, which you can see strengthens the aspect of taking interest in what's happening. You know, when we feel delight, we take interest. Rapture, joy, delight, pleasurable interest, you know, it's, it's all facets of the same quality in the mind, is said to be in direct opposition to ill will to aversion. And what that means is is that it's incompatible with aversion. When PT is present, aversion cannot be present. The example given is if somebody is sitting in a chair, there's no space for someone else to be sitting in it. When rapture has taken its seat, there's no room for ill will to sit down. So in order to clarify a bit our understanding and our experiential understanding of what this quality of PT or rapture is, we can distinguish it from another closely related factor and one with which it sometimes gets confused. And that's the factor in Pali of sukha. Now, what makes it confusing is that sukha is often translated in exactly the same way. 
we read the texts and translations of sukha are also often joy or happiness. So what's the difference? What's the distinction between them? Just uh, broadly on the conceptual level, sukha is part of the second foundation of mindfulness, pleasant feeling. It's a kind of feeling, pleasant feeling. PT is part of the fourth foundation of mindfulness. It's a mental factor, which is part of this fourth aggregate of formations. So rapture, the quality or the factor of rapture, has an intense energy to it. It's an energy of arousal. It's an, it's an energy of anticipation. The example given in the text, and see if you can just put yourself in this situation, you have been on this long trek across a hot desert, you know, and you're tired and you're thirsty, just dragging yourself one step after another, and then off in the distance, you see an oasis, and the oasis is for real, it's not a mirage, right, and so you see this oasis, what would your mind feel like when you saw the oasis? That's rapture. That's PT. Just that anticipatory interest and happiness in seeing it. But sometimes the energy of PT can get so strong, this kind of excited aspect of it, you know, the energetic aspect can get so strong that sometimes it's unpleasant. At one point, I was uh, doing a two-month metta retreat in Burma with Saira Upandita. And the first month of that retreat, you know, I was just repeating the phrases over and over again, and it was intensive practice. And just the energy kept building and building and building. And for quite a few weeks of that first month, it just felt like my head was going to split open. You know, the pressure in it was so intense. And I'd go into Sayadaw and report my experience, and he'd say, oh, that's rapture. Thanks. <laughs> it didn't feel like rapture, at least my, my understanding of it at that time. So sometimes it can get very intense. Sukha, on the other hand, you know, which is also translated sometimes as happiness or joy, is a much softer experience. Sukha is that soft experience of comfort and of well-being. And again, going back to that example of crossing the desert and seeing an oasis, rapture is when we first see it, and kind of the, the excitement. Sukha, or happiness, is when we actually arrive in the oasis and we experience the coolness, we experience the relief. So that's that sense of greater ease. So piti and sukha, you could call it rapture and certain kind of happiness or joy. So just as the Buddha distinguished between worldly and unworldly feelings, and he did this in his description in that second foundation of mindfulness, mindfulness of feelings, he talked about worldly feelings and unworldly feelings. So here too there's a distinction between rapture that comes associated with sense pleasures, and this is called in some translations carnal rapture, or one of my favorite translations, rapture of the flesh. So that's one kind of rapture, the worldly kind. And then there's non-worldly rapture, which is born from seclusion which is born from renunciation. Now, seclusion and renunciation refers both to the external circumstances, you know, the seclusion and renunciation of being in a situation like this, you know, distant from worldly distractions. But it also means the renunciation and seclusion of mind when the hindrances or those factors that disturb the mind, 
you know, or trouble the mind, are overcome. That's, <clears throat> that's an inner kind of seclusion. When we're considering PT as a factor of awakening, it's not carnal rapture we're talking about. It's good to get that straight from the beginning. <laughs> the rapture as a factor of awakening is of the non-worldly type, non-worldly rapture. This kind of happiness, this kind of PT comes in two ways. It comes as a function of concentration and arises as a jhanic factor, you know, a factor of concentration absorptions. And rapture becomes very strong both in the first and second jhanas. Piti also arises as an intense happiness or pleasurable interest that's born of investigation and wisdom. So this is a slightly different flavor of this awakening factor. The kind of delight, the kind of happiness that comes from understanding. Inside our Utejaniya has been emphasizing this aspect of rapture a lot in his teachings. In one of the groups he said, you should be happy when you know or understand anything. I just like that phrase. When we know or understand anything, it brings a kind of delight into the mind. This kind of happiness, this kind of piti, is not particularly about pleasurable feeling. It's about knowing, it's about understanding. And when this joy is strong, when this piti is aroused, this is what sustains our interest in the practice. Because we have this just intense interest in the nature of our experience, in what is happening. We are motivated to inquire. We're motivated to understand because the very act of understanding makes us happy. And it makes us happy in a way that sense pleasures never can. So these are the words of the Buddha. The bhikkhu who retires to a lonely abode and has a clear mind experiences joy transcending that of ordinary people. This is one who is clearly perceiving the Dhamma. And I think we all have a taste of that. That's what I think keeps bringing us back, even in times of difficulty, you know, when it doesn't feel like it's going so easily. But we have, we have some experience of the taste of the joy of understanding. So this is this feeling, this quality of rapture within us. So at this point, we're really in a very wholesome process of a positive feedback loop, you know, of these beginning factors of enlightenment, beginners factors of awakening. The energy that arises from continuous mindfulness and investigation leads to rapture. We could call it a Dhamma joy or a Dhamma happiness. And this happiness inspires us to investigate further. And as we investigate further, the mindfulness and the energy gets stronger and there's more rapture. And the happier we are, we want to investigate further. And so it's just a wonderful spiral leading towards awakening, leading towards liberation. You know, it's, it's as if we prime the pump with mindfulness. And then as the mindfulness gets stronger, all the other factors of awakening roll on to freedom. One of the great Burmese masters of the late 19th century, uh, his name was Lady Sayadaw, and, and amazingly, 
adept practitioner and an amazing scholar. He wrote many, many wonderful manuals of Buddhism. He wrote, if the pleasure and joy experienced in Vipassana happiness, and if this kind of Dharma delight, Dharma joy, if the pleasure and joy experienced in Vipassana happiness, which is complete with the seven factors of awakening, be divided into 256 parts. So I don't know where he got that number. (laughs) Divided into 256 parts, one single part of that joy and pleasure exceeds the worldly joys and pleasures of kings among humans, devas and brahmas. So great is the joy and pleasure inherent in these factors of awakening. So there's something here. You know, and all of these are qualities of our own minds. It's not something outside of ourselves. These are factors or qualities that we can cultivate, that we are cultivating and developing. So how do we recognize piti? How do we recognize this rapture or happiness when it arises? How do we actually experience it? The Buddha spoke of five grades, or five levels of PT. So one he called, the first one he called minor rapture. And we may well have experienced this at different times. Sometimes we feel it as, you know, just kind of goosebumps, you know, certain, you know, light, tingle sensation in the body. Sometimes it's as if kind of the hair on the arms or the back of the neck kind of can raise a little bit. It's a kind of rapture. Sometimes there's a trembling of the body. Sometimes we feel it when the rapture is strong in this first grade. It has the power to actually lift the posture. You know, and it's when we're feeling, it's, it's like an energy flow in the body that just keeps us erect effortlessly. You know, often when people are first starting, it's, it's really an effort to maintain posture. And at a certain point, the force of the PT maintains it. And it really doesn't take any effort at all. So that's minor rapture. The second grade is momentary rapture. And this, this is the experience sometimes just of a sudden jolt. It's, the example is like of a, a flash of lightning. Sometimes we might feel it, there's the sensation uh, of like an elevator suddenly falling, you know, and that just a sudden dropping feeling. One time, this was way back in my days in India, but I had been doing at that time quite a bit of practice already, I was just doing some lying meditation and I had a moment of this momentary rapture, but very strong. It actually flung me from a lying position into an upright position. And of course, at the time, I didn't, I didn't know about the five grades of rapture, or, so I didn't know what was going on. But it was very powerful. So there are powerful energies at work. There's minor rapture, momentary rapture. The third level of PT is called wave-like or showering rapture. And this manifests as kind of just thrilling sensations coming throughout the mind and body, and they come like waves, you know, over and over again. And sometimes these waves of pleasurable feeling can get more and more intense with each wave. is the wave-like rapture. The fourth kind is called uplifting rapture. So when this is present, it feels like the whole body, you know, is just floating off the ground. And there's this very light floating sensation, as if we're just sitting on a cushion of air. We might feel kind of floating up and down. So the last time Saira Upandita was here, I was sitting the retreat, and I, 
in one sitting, I was particularly, I just had this very strong feeling of just, just floating. And I go into my report with him and I say, Saidao, you know, it's just like I'm floating on a magic carpet. And all he did was look at me and he said, have you ever been on a magic carpet? <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't really into interpretation. <laughs> Sometimes we feel this kind of rapture. Also in the walking meditation, it can feel at times like we're sinking into the ground. It's, it's almost like we're walking on a rubber membrane. You know, and it's, it's quite an unusual experience. And this is the functioning of PT, of rapture. In the Buddhist texts, this kind of uplifting rapture is said to get so strong that either through a spontaneous occurrence or through mastery of it, that it actually has the power to levitate the body off the ground. And the stories, you know, one reads in the texts of people flying through the air and doing these kinds of things. It's the, it's the function of this factor at work uh, in the mind. During one of our first three-month retreats that I was teaching, I had one yogi who came to me in an interview once, and he had been doing lying meditation uh, in his room. And he came and he said, you know, I was just doing lying meditation and my body floated two inches off the bed. Well, I was a pretty new teacher. (laughs) And all I could think to say at the moment was, did you note it? (laughs) (laughs) So whether it actually happened or it was just his feeling of what happened, I'm not sure. But that's what he reported. (laughs) So the last kind of rapture, there's momentary, there's minor rapture, momentary, wave-like, uplifting. Last kind of rapture is called pervading rapture, or pervading joy. And Mahasi Sayadaw describes it this way. He said, a sublime feeling of happiness and exhilaration filling the whole body with an exceedingly sweet and subtle thrill. Um, so when we kind of think of all these poor renunciates, you know, sitting someplace in a cave and deprived of all the pleasures that we enjoy, we might remind ourselves actually of what's possible in terms of the kinds of happiness that come through the cultivation of mind. All of these different kinds of joy develop in our practice when there's a strong momentum of mindfulness and the five spiritual faculties come into balance. And at that time, the practice seems to be going on by itself. The mind is filled with tremendous confidence and energy because it's seeing and understanding how things are working. It's seeing the rise and fall of phenomena, it's seeing conditionality. And there's such a tremendous interest in coming to this deep understanding of ourselves, of this mind-body process, in ways and on levels that we just haven't experienced before. It fills us with this very intense, pleasurable interest. (laughs) And at these times, sometimes there's a kind of a luminosity of mind that actually can illuminate darkness. You know, some people have reported being able to see things in a dark room because of the luminosity in their mind. This time also, (coughs) sometimes we are able to recall with perfect clarity things from, you know, far distant past. And some people even report things that they believe to have been past life experiences. So it all comes from this 
tremendous uh, clarity and joy in the mind. So all of these are wholesome states that have been strengthened through the practice and they're now working on their own. It's like each one is just fulfilling its own function. Energy is doing its job. Rapture is doing its job. Faith is doing its job. But at this very wonderful time in practice, there's also a hidden danger. Because the mind can be so elated and excited by what it's seeing, what it's knowing and understanding and feeling, this excitement factor can be so strong that it's easy to lose sight of right attitude and right view. This is when we get caught up in what are called the imperfections of insight. Now, having been forewarned that this can happen, almost everyone thinks, I won't be caught in that. You know, I know, I know to watch out, you know, and I'm not going to get attached to these things when they come. And yet almost everyone does for a shorter or longer period of time. You know, this Vipassana joy, this Vipassana happiness is so strong that we begin to feel, oh, now I've got it. You know, finally I understand what this meditation is about. This is how my practice will be from now on, you know, because we've arrived. Or we become certain that no one else has ever experienced this. You know, it's so extraordinary that no, not my fellow yogas, not my teachers, they don't really know. You know the intensity is so captivating. We can become so exhilarated by the rapture and the other enlightenment factors at this time that we take this experience to be Nibbana, to be ultimate freedom. So one text describes all of this in this way. It says, when insight is adorned with these qualities, when insight is adorned with rapture and energy and faith, Attachment arises, which is subtle and peaceful, and it clings to that insight and is not able to discern the attachment as being a defilement. That's why it's so seductive. You know, the attachment arises, which itself is so subtle and peaceful, that we don't see it. We don't see the attachment as being a defilement. So I want to read you a story about this and about how in this particular case this attachment was addressed. And it's a story about an Arhant monk named Dhammadina. So he was a fully enlightened monk. And one day he was sitting and he thought of his own teacher, an elder, the elder's name was Mahanaga. And this elder had taught many, many bhikkhus, you know, many of whom had become fully enlightened. So Dhammadina is thinking about his teacher and beginning to wonder, is my teacher finished? You know, is he really fully enlightened? Is he an arhant? As it says in the text, has he brought his work to completion or not? Then he looked with his kind of psychic eye and he saw that his teacher was still an ordinary man. And he knew that if he did not go to him, his teacher would die as an ordinary man. So Dhammadina rose up into the air, with supernormal power, all the rapture, and alighted near the elder who was sitting in his daytime quarters. <clears throat> he paid homage to him and sat down to one side. Why have you come unexpectedly, friend Dhammadina? The elder asked. I've come to ask a question, Venerable Sarah. Remember, this is his teacher. 
So ask, friend, if we know we shall say. So Dhamma Dinner then asked a thousand questions, and the elder replied without hesitation to each one. Dhamma Dinner said, Your knowledge is very keen, sir. When was this state attained by you? The elder replied, Sixty years ago, friend. Okay, so he apparently had become enlightened 60 years ago, apparently. So then Dhammadina asks him, do you practice concentration, sir? The elder replies, that's not difficult, friend. Dhammadina says, then make an elephant. So the, through concentrated power. So the elder made an apparent elephant. Then Dhammadina says, now make that elephant come straight at you with his ears outstretched, his tail extended, putting his trunk in his mouth and making a horrible trumpeting. The elder did so. But upon seeing the frightful aspect of the rapidly approaching elephant, he sprang up and made to run away. Then Dhammadina, the arhant, put out his hand and catching him by the hem of his robe said, Venerable sir, is there any timidity in one whose taints are destroyed. Then the elder recognized that he was still an ordinary man. He knelt at Dhammadina's feet and said, Help me, friend Dhammadina. Venerable sir, I will help you. That is why I have come. Do not worry. I love that line. I will help you. This is why I have come. Do not worry. Then he expounded a meditation subject to him. The elder took the meditation subject and went up onto the walk, and with the third footstep, he reached our hunship. These are great stories. <laughs> but that's what it took in order for that elder to see that what he had taken to be Nibbana, to be ultimate truth, was none. You know, it's that very subtle attachment to these peaceful, happy states. Make an elephant. (laughs) Have it come trumpeting at you. See what happens. So on the one hand, we want to cultivate rapture, we want to cultivate PT, we want to cultivate all these factors of awakening. These are the factors, when they come together, are the cause and condition right, for enlightenment to happen. But on the other hand, we need to know how to work with them either so that there is no attachment or to work with the attachment when it arises. So here's where we have to bring in right view. We have to bring in right attitude. We have to bring in an investigative wisdom into play, understanding that all of these delightful states, and they're very delightful and very joyous, are impermanent and they don't belong to anyone. They are all conditioned. They're all conditioned by various causes. And each one simply arising and expressing its own nature. This is a very critical understanding at this point because it points us in the right direction at a juncture in practice where it's easy to take the wrong direction. And there's a name for this juncture. When we can bring wisdom to it, when we can bring right view, it's called the insight into discerning what is the path and what is not the path. And so it's very important to understand this deeply so we're not seduced by these very wonderful states of mind, these very wonderful experiences. So how do we come to this insight of discerning what is the path and what is not the path? You know, so we see clearly at this point, remembering that it's not easy to see clearly. So we really need to arouse 
a lot of interest and investigation. When we recognize one of the manifestations of piti, of rapture arising, we need to recognize it for what it is. We might feel it in the body as a momentary you know, wave or many waves of pleasurable sensation coming. We might experience it as a heightened interest in the mind, just that quality of pleasurable, rapt interest in what's happening. So we want to recognize it as PT and then look at the mind's relationship to it. So it's not simply a matter of recognizing it and focusing exclusively on the PT itself as an object. We want to recognize it and it's almost like we step to the side and see, well, how is the mind relating to this? What is the attitude in the mind about it? Are we relating to it with the wrong view? This is mine. This has arisen in me. That's a wrong view. Are we relating to it with conceit? Right? This rapture, all these good feelings, this is who I am. That's conceit. Are we relating through desire and craving? I like this. I want this to continue. We may think we're not doing any of these things. You know, we, we may think we're just being perfectly mindful of it all. But as a clue, look at how you feel when these very pleasurable feelings go away, when they disappear, when they fade. Are you abiding in perfect equanimity? Or is there a feeling of disappointment? You know, the very common thought, what did I do wrong? Why did it leave? Is there the feeling of wanting it to come back? All of those are signals, right? That there's some level of attachment present. So although there's this potential for rapture and these factors of awakening to become imperfections of insight because of attachment to it, still, these are the very qualities that we are cultivating in our practice. So we want to recognize the danger, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be cultivating and strengthening them. They are the factors of awakening. And so we just have to come to a proper understanding of them. There's a well-known Buddhist scholar, a British scholar, his name is Getin. He points out that it's precisely this factor of rapture, or dharma happiness, and the next awakening factor of calm that are at the heart of the core of all the positive emotional affect of Dharma practice. And I think this is really important because sometimes on hearing the teachings, they can seem you know, very dry and analytic with, with all the lists and all the different categories. And so we hear the teachings and it can feel very conceptual, it can feel very intellectual. But as we practice, as we put the teachings into practice, these feelings of happiness, of contentment, of joy, of well-being, begin to gradually pervade our lives. Now Suzuki Roshi, in his book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, he speaks very beautifully of how this process happens. So he wrote, after you have practiced for a while, you will realize that it is not possible to make rapid, extraordinary progress. Even though you try very hard, the progress you make is always little by little. 
It's not like going out in a shower in which you know when you get wet. In a fog, you do not know you're getting wet. But as you keep walking, you get wet little by little. If your mind has ideas of progress, you may say, oh, this pace is terrible. But actually, it is not. When you get wet in a fog, it is very difficult to dry yourself. So there is no need to worry about progress. Just to be sincere and make our full effort in each moment is enough. And especially for the Western mind, I think that's such important advice because we're so often measuring ourselves against some idea of progress. And in terms of Dharma practice, it's useless. And it just causes us a lot of internal turmoil. We just take it one step at a time. And if we're sincere in our practice and keep on practicing, it's like that walk in the fog. We get wet in a way that's very hard to dry off. These factors of mind actually are strengthened, and they are cultivated, and they become part of how we live. So PT arises when there's a strong momentum of mindfulness. It arises out of a delight in clear seeing, of knowing. And one of the great discoveries in meditation is that there can be PT, there can be rapture, there can be delight, even in an exploration of the hindrances. As we come to a deeper understanding of them, you know, so it's not like that's outside of our field of investigation. The very times when we're feeling the different hindrances, that's when we can bring investigation to bear. So just as an example, what happens when you're feeling bored or discontent in your practice? Does that ever happen? You know, I'm sure... At times it does. Now, in one sense, boredom and disinterest is the very opposite of PT. So you would think, well, how can I possibly work with these states of being bored and disinterested in a way that arouses PT? When we investigate or look at the nature of boredom, we see that it has nothing at all to do with the object. It's not that the object is boring, and that's why we're bored. It has to do with the quality of our attention. Fritz Perls, who was one of the originators of Gestalt psychology, he had this very incisive phrase. He said, boredom is lack of attention. And when I first heard that, that is exactly the meditative experience. It's what I call, this lack of attention is what I call more or less mindful. You know, when we're going through the day and we're kind of mindful, we're more or less mindful, but we're not closely mindful. We're not really paying attention. So instead of struggling through this experience of boredom or disinterest, which is how we often relate to it, and we struggle through it, we can actually take that very feeling as feedback to us. When we're feeling bored or disinterested, instead of struggling with it, we actually take it as feedback to tell us That tells us about the quality of our attention. Those states are telling us, they're reminding us, the attention is not close. So, in the midst of the boredom, in the midst of the disinterest, we can step back and ask the question, 
what is happening now? What is the mind knowing in this moment? We arouse the interest in that very state. We become interested in just what is there. So again, this this is a night for Suzuki Roshi. Uh, and those of you who have never read Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, this is a classic. I, it came out, I don't know, in the 70s, I guess. Uh, and it's just this beautiful collection of little uh, Dharma teachings. So <clears throat> he wrote, We say pulling out the weeds, we give nourishment to the plant. We pull the weeds and bury them near the plant to give it nourishment. So even though you have some difficulty in your practice, even though you have some waves while you are sitting, those waves themselves will help you. So you should not be bothered by your mind. You should rather be grateful for the weeds because eventually they will enrich your practice. But how often do we really see the difficulties in that way? Do we welcome them? Oh, good, this will enrich my practice. Or we can remind ourselves to hold it in this way. And it's so amazing that when we do, it becomes the cause for piti, for dharma interest to arise. We're at a juncture. (laughs) The Buddha also spoke of different reflections that can arouse piti. And there are a whole list of them. I think I'll just start with the first one. So it will be about the right time. Um, And then continue with the others next week. So in addition to the rapture that comes simply through continuous mindfulness and the investigation and close attention, the Buddha said that Reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha bring about rapture. It's easy to hear those words and kind of think, yeah, that sounds right. You know, and it's, yeah, <laughs> reflecting on the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha is probably a good thing. It might be worth, though, actually doing it just by way of experiment and interest and doing it in a way not by rote, you know, not by some formula, but really to feel for ourselves, each in our own way, well, what is the meaning of the Buddha Dharma Sangha for me? You know, and for myself, when I do that, and I just reflect on the qualities of the Buddha. And of course, there are many you know, we could focus on. But for me, it's always the kind of awe and amazement of thinking of a human being who actually was able to look into the mind and understand it in its entirety. You know, with all of its subtlety, we have trouble watching two breaths in a row. You know, when we see where we're practicing and then imagine the unbelievable qualities that the Buddha must have had to understand the mind in the way he did. It is really, for me, awe-inspiring. You know, and it's a human being. This is, this is a potential you may each have your own way of reflecting on the Buddha. But when I think of that, it makes me very happy. It's like just talking about it, I can feel the energy arising. You know, or reflecting on the Dharma. Can you imagine what your life would be like without the level of Dharma understanding that we have? I mean, it illuminates so much of our lives. It illuminates so much 
about the causes of happiness and the causes of suffering. It just opens up for us the possibility of wise choice in our lives. It's amazing. It's an amazing understanding. So reflecting on the Dharma, again, in your own way, it creates rapture, it creates this sense of piti. Reflecting on the Sangha, it's inspiring to think that very ordinary people, not, not the Buddha, but very ordinary people for thousands of years have been walking on the path and coming to tremendous depth of realization. You know, so it's encouraging. You know, as we're dealing with our mind weeds and trying to, to put them near the plant to nourish it, you know, as we're involved in all this, just to realize countless beings have been walking the same path. You know, so again, it just it brings energy. One more story. We'll end with a story <coughs> of the power of the rapture that come that can come from reflecting on the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. This is a story of a young woman in ancient Sri Lanka. And one evening her parents were about to go to the monastery to hear the teachings. But she was in an advanced pregnancy and her parents thought it wasn't it wasn't a good time for her to go, you know, to leave the house. So they said, My dear, you are expecting a child. We shall hear the Dharma and gain merit for you. So they went out. And though she wanted to go to, she could not well object to what they had said. She stepped out of the house onto a balcony and stood looking at the monastery shrine lit by the moon. She saw the offerings of lamps, the offerings of flowers and perfumes. She heard the sound of the chanting by the community of bhikkhus. Then she thought, how lucky they are to be able to go to the monastery and wander around such a shrine and listen to such sweet preaching of Dhamma. Then seeing the shrine as a mound of pearls and arousing uplifting happiness, she sprang up into the air and before her parents arrived, she came down from the air onto the shrine terrace where she paid homage and stood listening to the Dhamma. When her parents arrived, they asked her, what road did you come by? She said, I came through the air, not by the road. And when they said, my dear, only those whose taints are destroyed come through the air. How did you come? She replied, as I was standing looking at the shrine in the moonlight, a strong sense of happiness arose in me with the enlightened one as its object. Then I knew no more whether I was standing or sitting, but only that I was springing up into the air with the sign that I had grasped, and I came to rest on the shrine terrace. I can just imagine it. (laughs) You know, just so filled. I mean, that's a high degree of devotion. (laughs) But just so filled with kind of the light and rapture. Sort of a Buddhist Mary Poppins. (laughs) That's just... (laughs) rising up into the air and landing on the terrace. So as we practice, as we continue, you know, we begin to taste kind of the joy and the happiness of the Dhamma in many of these different ways. And the Buddha summed it up in one verse of the Dhammapada. And it so, I think, characterizes our own experience in some way, where he says, the gift of Dhamma surpasses all gifts. The taste of Dhamma surpasses all tastes. The delight in Dhamma surpasses all delights. The destruction of craving conquers all suffering.
So let's sit. Letting the rapture lift us up. Mm-hmm.